So thank you for joining us today. today. My name is Patty Olinger. I'm the Executive Director of the Global Biorisk Advisory Council. Today's webinar is brought to you by GBAC, and I would like to briefly tell you a little bit about GBAC. So today, the topic is future-proofing your hotel in the age of pandemics. Now, GBAC was created specifically to deal with situations that involved in infectious disease outbreaks and pandemics in any situation where a biological material may be released and need to be taken care of or cleaned up. What we found was during the pandemic is that there was a great need, a great need for education, for communication, and to be able to help organizations reopen. And to, when we look at it, our whole mantra at the time was prepare, respond, recover. And what we're finding is that the importance here is also in resilience. The pandemic really had a significant impact, as we all know. It made us shift the way that we're thinking of health, wellness, and resilience. Um, a few, you know, you know, when we look at where we spend a lot of our time within GBAC, we spend it primarily with the hospitality industry. We also um, spend a lot of time with our transportation organizations, as well as our events, including trade shows, meetings, meeting planners, banquets, and even weddings. So when we look at health, wellness, and resilience, it really asks, answers the question as to why. We are very social beings. We want to get out. We want to be together. We travel for multiple different reasons, whether it's business, whether it's personal, and also just darn right pleasure. We want to be able to enjoy life and we want to be able to enjoy life again. We're also finding that as we start to reopen, the whole importance, what we hear a lot is ESG or UN Sustainable Development Goals. How does health, wellness, and resilience fit into an organization's ESG initiatives? A true, in my world, in Gavin's world, um, a true One Health philosophy. So as we get started today with our partners and with the International Luxury Hotel Association and our wonderful panelists, we'll, which I'll introduce in just a minute, we want to make sure that we understand that we are all in this together. We're here to help and support um, moving forward in, to become resilient in this world of pandemics. So today we have some amazing individuals who are very tied to the hospitality industry. And I'm going to let them introduce themselves, but it's one of those things that I could not give them justice for their backgrounds in, in this area. But first I'll introduce my partner here at GBAC, Dr. Gavin McGregor-Skinner. He's a senior director within GBAC and I've had the fortunate, um, you know, career um, time to spend a lot of time with Gavin over the years in some very interesting situations from a standpoint of pandemic preparedness and response. Gavin. Thanks, Patty. Hi, everyone. I'm Dr. Gavin McGregor Skinner. I work with Patty. I'm the senior director. And really, with, with our program, our GBAC Star program, we work together to focus on cleaning for health, but, but to ensure that what we do with hotels and other, many other facilities is sustainable, it's responsible, but it's also cost-effective and it's backed by science and, and measurement. So it's really important that we, we get this right. So as we've seen a wonderful evolution of cleaning over the last two years with the pandemic, we need to make sure that that continues in the future. So I'd like to also introduce Mr. Mike Sullivan. Hi, I'm a, a partner with Suncroft Capital, which is an ownership, operating, and asset management firm in the hotel space. I'm a 30-year uh, veteran of the hotel industry. I like to say I've done everything in the hotel space, from a 3,000-room hotel casino to a 19-room luxury dive camp in Indonesia and everything in between. Um, and that fits what we do. We're opportunistic, and we work with a wide variety of hotels from a 
branded Hampton Inn to a luxury boutique in the mountains uh, and everything in between. Thank you. And Anton. Hi, everybody. I, my name is Anton Moore. I'm the general manager of the Ganza Ford Hotel here in the Meatpacking District in New York City, a 186 uh, bedroom luxury lifestyle hotel that just underwent a $30 million renovation. Um, I started my career in the west of Ireland, where I'm from, at Ashford Castle, moved to New York 20 years ago and started uh, here at the Waldorf Astoria. Um, and it's a pleasure to be here and on the panel. Thank you for having me. Thank you. And my good friend, Frank Levy. Hi, good day, everyone. Uh, I'm Frank Levy. Uh, I recently retired from Hyatt Hotels Corporation after uh, 35 uh, wonderful years. Um, uh, at retirement, I was the Senior Vice President of Global Operations. We had the very good fortune of finding Patty and the GBAC crew uh, early on in the pandemic. And I, I, I'm so thankful for everything that they did to educate us and help develop a, a really great platform for communications with all of our colleagues and certainly with our customers as we've tried to, uh, I guess, boost their confidence in our in our uh, uh, sanitation and, and cleaning protocols and, and, and get them back in our hotels. Uh, I know we also worked very closely with Patty and American Airlines and, again, another important part of the travel industry and, again, getting everybody's confidence back to, to get out there and travel. And the good news is they are. <laughs> they are. Um, and it's wonderful. Um, well, let's get started with some questions. Moving forward, how do we look at the future and how do we prepare? You know, hotels gather people together um, just by nature. Uh, this could be in a small boutique luxury hotel, 20 rooms, um, and it could be a large venue in, in a major metropolitan area such as New York. You know, regardless of the space and the size, people move throughout these facilities. They touch many surfaces. They they are in social little gatherings. Hotel operations have had to move quickly during the pandemic uh, for, with COVID-19. Um, also with the um, concerns that are now being raised with monkey packs. What do we do? Gavin, um, you're seeing some trends I know, and especially with how hospitality measures and, and how we communicate their commitment to health, you know, to wellness, to being resilient. You know, that whole aspect of how do we communicate that with our ESG metrics, as well as, you know, supporting that UN Sustainability Development Goals? Can you expand on that, please? We've seen a, a very significant evolution of not only procedures, practices, but communication. So even within our GBAC star program, Patty, we, we talk to general managers, we talk to CEOs, we talk to operation managers, vice presidents, we talk all the way down to the front line of central workers within the hotel industry. The message seems to be very clear, very precise. People want to come and stay in a hotel now and feel safe. And they that's where that emphasis now on cleaning for health. So this, this links in really nicely with uh, hotels that have developed a framework for their environmental, social and governance priorities or their ESG priorities. And we're often hearing from especially general managers of hotels that the GBAC is one piece of that puzzle that really helps with the intersection between their heart, what they really want to do, but also their business performance. And very cost effectively, very simply, we've been able to set up metrics, validations, measurements, the way to visualize what's being done. So, so many people are coming into a hotel going, how do I know the lobby's clean? How do I know the restaurant is clean and healthy and safe? I go into a room, there was another person or another family in this room yesterday. How do I know in the time from that family left to the time that I'm in there now that my room is now clean and safe? And it's really giving the ability to the hotels that have been doing this for many, many years, but that ability to communicate, this is how we do it. And that's one of the key 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 areas we're focusing now, now, now as we move forward in strengthening and uh, those environmental, social governance, those ESG strategies, but also bring more value to both employees in hotels and also the customers on how we do stuff. Uh, thank you, Gavin. Um, you know, when we start looking at resilience in uncertain times, and there's so many different aspects to this. And when we look at what changes, you know, that have been implemented that help hotels better, you know, handle these uncertain times. And how do we see these changes help and build resilience? Michael, Antoon, Frank, um, 
you know, if you could expand on that, um, Michael, why don't we start with you? How are you seeing this affecting hotels? Well, for, there's a variety of things, obviously, we can all touch on, but I think one of the big things is making sure you have a strong team. The teams that work together, it's kind of corny, we all say it, we all paid it lip service, but it's become more true than ever. Whether it be because of the shortfalls with people being out with health issues or whatever else that need to fill in, or the fact that you need to help each other, make sure if somebody is sick, you can help them. Um, you really want a team that can communicate well and help each other, as well as you know everyone kind of has to be cross-trained so they can help each other. We have a lot of labor shortages that we've all seen in the industry, but we're also having labor shortages around these pandemics for illnesses, and you need people to be able to step in and, and fill in. So you can't have somebody that just works at the front desk or somebody who just works in sales. Everyone has to be able to do a little bit of everything and help out each other. I think it's become more critical than ever. Uh, we can't just pay a lip service. We actually have to put it into action. Yeah, um, I hear that quite a bit. Um, Anton, do you want to expand on that? Yeah, I think those are uh, you know excellent points. I think really um, no one could have prepared us for 2019. So you know, there's no page in in any manual that's going to prepare you for what happens when a pandemic hits. And I think uh, for myself. And I think for others in the industry, that fear has been lifted now. When we talk about resilience and we talk about things that are coming down the pipeline or the possibilities, I think now that that fear factor has been lifted and, and as those months during the pandemic in, in those early, you know, March, 2020, you know, as the hotel was being closed, as we were learning and being educated on, on what was going on with COVID-19. As we look, unfortunately, to the future, uh, be it monkeypox, be it another variant, um, because we've been through um, 2020 and those months, I think we're more prepared now mentally to face the extraordinary challenges that we did in 2020. So I think just the sheer learnings that we had in those months are now preparing us for the future, if, if that makes sense. Absolutely. Um, Frank, we worked together on the whole entire Hyatt enterprise, which, um, you know, when you first came and said, yeah, we're going to do the, we want to really, you know, work with you and the whole entire enterprise. I was like, oh, this is really great by the end of the year. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and, um, those challenges, taking a organization like Hyatt Hotels in it from a global perspective, um, can you expand on, on the types of challenges that you've had? Yeah, I mean, well, as you remember, Patty, we were really learning in waves because, you know, we had that being a global organization, you know, this started in the Asia Pacific region. So we, we watched what was happening there, although their governments took a very different approach and really how they, they started the lockdown process. And then it started sweeping across Europe. So by the time it got to the States, we had somewhat of, uh, and, and, and we, we knew what the expectations were, right? But it was really, I think, um, you know, Gavin hit it on the head when he said it's about making people feel safe. And I think that, you know, having a really solid communications plan um, so that you're going to build back that confidence, not just in your, in your colleagues so that they, they're feeling safe coming back to work, but for your, your guests to come back into the hotel. Uh, for your your communities, for your owners, so that they know what's going on. Um, so the communications plan is is really essential. And then again, maintaining that vigilance about how you uh, are are practicing all of your your housekeeping protocols. Um, you have to moving forward. We have to you know really maintain an airtight uh, housekeeping uh, uh, protocol throughout all of our facilities. Uh, and, and then, you know, I think one of the things that we really did learn and we're going to have to practice this moving forward is respecting people's space and, and, and giving your guests a choice, whether it's in, you know, food and beverage delivery to the room, uh, their entry to the hotel, how they engage with your staff, um, you know, housekeeping services. Again, a lot of people have been opting to, to forego housekeeping services or have them every couple of days because they're very wary about, you know, again, Gavin touched on this before about, hey, somebody has been in this room before me. Uh, I want to know that it's super clean when I got in there, and if it's if there's somebody entering the room uh, in your absence, that you know they've had again all of the the practices in place to ensure that there's not uh, not any chance of anybody getting sick. Yeah, there has been quite a few challenges in that, and yeah. a lot of discussions in those areas. Um, so when we look at some of the, I would say over the last two years, some of the 
things that you didn't think about that you were going to have to implement or maybe some uniquenesses or some of the you know solutions that you definitely want to keep you know we've seen some amazing innovations come through in the last couple of years we continue to see innovations coming through and they'll um even now um what are some of the lessons that you've learned beyond what we've just talked about that you see as extremely important with resilience um and two we'll start with you with myself sorry yes okay. um i think that the biggest to me is is the human aspect is that you know for for all of us in hospitality you know creating mem memorable experiences that was you know why we're in this industry you know to make sure that we're creating something magical uh for guests and whether you're a business traveler or leisure traveler celebrating your wedding day. Um, but now really understanding on top of that, there's the health risk, right? So the understanding that the guest is not look, not only looking for that memorable experience, but the safety factor, I think is, this, is the lesson learned and something that we can implement moving, for, moving for, uh, forward. One of the biggest things in those early days was, you know, we, we know our guest rooms are clean. We know our lobbies are clean. But are they disinfected? You know, I, I during that time I learned so much. I thought I should move into the hospital industry and work in the hospital because I was learning so much about disinfectants. We've kept that um, process, uh, you know, here at Gansevoort. And I think that that ability to not only speak to the celebrations and the memories that we're creating, but to talk about the human health aspect and the importance of making sure that the environment that our guests and our employees are is is safe uh, from a you know disinfecting and and antibacterial standpoints, so that guests feel comfortable as well as our team members. Thank you, Michael. Yeah, I think I think I would follow up with Anton's point. I think um, I would elaborate on the employee side. Is you know we were all focused on the guests, but we also had to make sure our employees feel safe, and that was something that hit me hard during the pandemic where. In the early days, we were trying to keep all of our hotels in our portfolio open. And I was under the impression that's what all the employees would want. They'd want to stay employed. They'd want to see it continue. We actually had only, we only closed one hotel, and that was because actually the employees didn't feel safe coming to work. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, New York City was, you know, ground zero of a lot of what the U.S. saw in the pandemic. And a number of the employees simply did not feel safe. And so we did listen and we closed for a period of time. Uh, and worked with them on how not only we would reopen, but how we would set up workstations and everything else so they could feel safe handling the guests coming into the hotel. Um, so we do have to, you know, think about the guest and the employees as we go forward. Yeah, and Frank. Yeah, and you know, Patty, looking back two and a half years ago, we were really, we were learning on the fly, you know, so we had to stay very flexible and just keep your eyes and ears open and, and, and you know, listen to the experts. But, you know, we, we, we really went through this transition of, you know, we were, and you'll recall this, we were, we were in, in a mad dash to buy every electrostatic sprayer that was out on the market. Uh, then everything shifted towards, you know, contact tracing, and we were looking for the best kind of geofence that we could create to keep everybody safe. Uh, then it was into testing, right? How, how quickly can we test? We were buying up, you know, from Abbott, we were buying, you know, hundreds of thousands of test kits to ensure that mm -hmm. people were doing so prior to coming back into the workplace. Uh, and then it was into vaccinations, right? And the silly little cards that people would carry around, which again, looking back, it's pretty ridiculous. So, but I, you know, I, 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 I don't believe this is gonna be the last pandemic that we'll, we'll face. Uh, but as I say, I think we really learned a lot here. This was kind of unprecedented. And so I think just again, keeping your eyes and ears open, having, as I said before, a, a really you know, airtight communications plan uh, just so that everybody's kind of staying on the same page. And um, yeah, I'm confident uh, we'll 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 get through whatever you know challenges come at us in the future. Absolutely. Gavin, do you have anything to add to this? Yeah, I think what I what we've seen um, with the the Global Biorisk Advisory Council team or the GBAC team, Patty, is task shifting. And all the hotels are saying to me, whose responsibility is it to keep that hand sanitizer full? of the hand sanitizer. And the guests have come into the lobby, they've come into the hotel, and they have an expectation that when they go to a hand sanitizer, it works. And a lot of that 
pre-pandemic in 2019, that was the role of maybe the cleaning professionals, but now it's everyone's responsibility because we can provide that training on how to refill a hand sanitizer. Um, you and I just had an experience, Patty, with a hotel recently where we said, if you wanted to enhance your hotel's health, wellness, and safety, who on your staff would you like us to train? And that hotel came and said, everyone, all 2,300 employees, they want to be trained. Okay, what do we want to be trained in? Well, this particular hotel had a golf course. And they said, well, should we be worried about the golf carts when people have sat there, played around a golf? What do we do before the next group get in? Well, we came up with a protocol for four minutes. This is how you clean and disinfect and make a golf cart safe again. And they went, oh, who does that? The guy at the golf cart. <laughs> he's, he's, he's right there. You don't have to wait for this emergency team to come in. It's, it's part of everyone's responsibility. It fits in really nicely. So in, for me, professionally, task shifting and training has been a real critical part of this. And people have taken more responsibilities than they were probably in 2019. I think that's a wonderful thing. I do too. Um, and it is something that we have seen a lot of shifting. Um, I've sat with some GMs of multiple different hotels around the world. The one that really got me was a, a group that they were just starting to reopen. It was their very first banquet. Um, and the they only had like five people in the hotel. And this is a big hotel. And the GM literally was, they had explained to me that in a one day they flipped 96 beds and they helped flipping 96 beds. Now you guys know what that means. It seems like a lot to me, but the individual said, I could hardly walk at the end of the day. Um, and they had a real new perspective as to what that meant. They also, that weekend bus tables, they were literally, they understood what their people were having to deal with on a day-to-day -day basis. And when you are overwhelmed with, with staff shortages, we all know that that's when things start to fall. And what I've seen in some of the, um, in the hospitality industry is that's something that they don't want to see. Um, and Tony, you, you had indicated that magical experience and especially in the, in the luxury hotel associations and the, you know, it's that magical experience that you want people to, to have, to come back, to, to feel comfortable. So as we start to look to the future, there are trends, you know, when 9-11 hit, we knew that security in the world was going to change. And we saw things that stayed with us. If we start to look to the future and let's keep our fingers crossed that we don't have another pandemic, say for another five years, um, 10 years, 30 years, somewhere in the future, what are the things that you see that will stay with us moving forward? Um, Frank, why don't we start with you this time? Yeah, you know, the dynamics have changed a lot. You know, we're still, as, as much as the, the, the business levels are, are very strong right now, it's a different mix of business, right? So a, a lot more leisure travel. And that was the first uh, really market segment to recover business and, and you know, the corporate uh, groups and things like that are, are, are coming back uh, and, and we'll be back in full force. I think one of the, the the biggest changes we're trying to accommodate for is now that people have you know gotten used to working remotely and employers are being a lot more flexible. You know, it used to be that I had one week of vacation and I'm going to go to Hawaii and I I've got to fly on this day. Here are my dates of my stay and I got to be back by this day. And now people are taking extended vacations and working remotely and I think it's a real bonus for us. Um, and we've been trying to at, at Hyatt you know accommodate whatever those needs are so that we can create a a comfortable work environment while they're staying at one of our resorts or one of our urban properties. So that, I think that's a trend that's here to stay. Michael? Yeah, uh, I would echo that as well as also, I think a lot more emphasis on outdoors. Um, even in our hotels that are not in a leisure destination, you're seeing more like social groups, individuals that want to be outside, they feel safer outside than indoors. So you're seeing a lot more event setups that are being arranged to be outdoors. Um, and I think that will continue as well. I think not only people like being outside, which they should, it's healthy, um, but it just makes people feel safer if they're outside rather than trapped in a meeting room. And Antoine. 
I think for you know us and I would speak for the hotels in in the New York market, um, the local tri-state. I think the drive market um, people. I, I think unfortunately, as as the airlines are are desperately trying to stabilize, I think it's going to take uh, the airlines some time to get back to the regular um, travel patterns and and pilots and aircrafts and some of the challenges they're facing. That we will continue to see that drive market, as we call it, leisure tri-state area local community uh, going for those short shorter staycations. Um, our weekend business, our leisure business is, is so high. And I think uh, that's going to continue at least through next year and potentially beyond. You know, I also feel that the short-term nature of bookings, um, we see it here continuously where, you know, I'm no longer pan panicking of, of soft numbers two weeks from now because that business is picking up so quickly. I think people are making decisions um, in a much more shorter booking window than they did in the past. And I would imagine that too is going to continue um, over the next couple of years. Yeah, I, I think you're right. I, the, the travel industry obviously is is struggling a little bit with keeping, I mean, um, Gavin and I are here in Chicago and we already had several members of our team that are here um, take to go from Cleveland to Chicago. It took them two days because of, you know, travel issues that they dealt with. Um, and we've seen that, you know, one of the things that I've seen, and, and you mentioned that you've been with Ashford Castle, which we've worked with, um, what I'm seeing in some of the hotels, you know, for a long time, we, we see experiences, they, they promote experiences. And we've seen those experiences a lot with, you know, sustainability and, the, and, um, our, our green sustainable um, colleagues, our, 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 our siblings, you might say, with ESG um, and UN Sustainable Development Goals, we're starting to see that whole big picture of health, wellness, resilience, both from the environment, from social responsibilities, and then from that governance standpoint. We've had a couple groups start talk about, and I see this more in resorts, uh, uh, Simon Marxier. Um, who is with Mirabal Spas from Hyatt, um, I had the pleasure to work with. And what we see is that whole being human um, philosophy of experiences. And do you see that as a, as a draw um, in your clientele that's coming um, in that experience, not just from a sustainability standpoint of green, but also from that health and wellness as well. Oh, 100%. You know, tomorrow night on the Gansenburg rooftop, uh, we're having a health and well wellness evening. Um, and to think, you know, at one stage, you know, all of the nightlife and fun activities that continuously play a role here, but wellness and health is, is the forefront of people's minds. And we have definitely adapted to that um, and are strategically aligning ourselves with different wellness brands to ensure that we have that offering. And I think, you know, the, the, uh, our location and our, our wide plazas and streets outside, uh, our guests feel very comfortable in this neighborhood. And I think people are looking for that where, again, a couple of years ago, that might not have been something when you come to New York, I wanna stay in a neighborhood that has lots of open spaces. You know, between our plazas out front, um, the incredible Little Island uh, that opened last year, to um, the High Line, we have all of this neighborhood features that we're promoting uh, to our guests, our future guests, uh, to ensure that they are feeling comfortable when coming to, to this neighborhood. So 100% uh, wellness is, is playing a, a major factor um, in our clientele. Michael? Yeah, no, we're seeing similar. Uh, the hotels that we have that are particularly located near what I call active outdoor areas, uh, whether it's skiing, hiking, you know, beaches, et cetera, have been doing phenomenal. I mean, not only obviously the drive to has been popular throughout the hospitality industry over the last couple of years, but I'm mean, in particular seeing where there's an activity center that people are out doing healthy activities rather than just sitting around. Um, they really want that and crave it. I think after everyone was stuck inside for two years, they're excited to get out and move. Absolutely. And Frank. <laughs> 
Yeah, I mean, well-being has always been a, a particular area of focus for us, whether it's, you know, in your work-life balance and then, you know, everything that we've gone through in the last two and a half years has really been, you know, it was a big change for people like working from home and, you know, having to balance, you know, taking care of your families and, you know, all the, 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 the restrictions that were in place in all, in all the big cities and all of that. So, um, you know, we really focus not just on, on physical, but also uh, mental well-being um, and, and we'll continue to do that. Um, but you know, kind of switching to the ESG side, you know, when, when I was working at Hyatt, I had the environmental sustainability group under my umbrella, and we were on this major quest to eliminate single use plastics. And, and that got, you know, shot to hell with the pandemic, right? Because plastic water mm -hmm. bottles, rubber gloves, masks, all these disposable items. And so it's going to take us, I think, years to get that back on track, but uh, we'll, we'll still continue to push in that direction. Oh, yeah. I, you know, I mean, I think that the pandemic did take its toll on on that. Um, and what we're also seeing is with the economy the way it is, uh, people are more concerned sometimes about, am I gonna be able to put food on the table um, yeah. versus recycling a plastic bottle? Um, and we will get back to that whole, what we're seeing is, you know, what Gavin and I talk about is a One Health kind of perspective. The other thing that we're starting to see in this area of, you know, healthy hotels, and I think that luxury hotels really will, will lead this effort is some of the new technologies that we're starting to look at with indoor air quality. And um, not just with the indoor air quality, Frank, you mentioned um, electrostatic sprayers, but different technologies that help you do a, the job better. Um, Gavin, can you talk a little bit about the healthy air um, that you're working with on the initiatives as far as what you're seeing in the industry and some changes? Yeah, this is really interesting. And I, I would actually say, Patty, it's caught me by surprise. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the fact that I can pick up my cell phone, I go to my weather app and I'm a runner. So when I go for a run, I want to see what the outdoor air quality is. And my, my, my cell phone tells me the outdoor air quality is this. And then I make a, a, a personal risk assessment, a personal judgment. Do I go for a run today or not? What I'm seeing is that I'm, I'm actually seeing a, a shift from not just looking at outdoor air, but now indoor air, the quality of indoor air. And I'm surprised, Patty, by the hotels that are being able to demonstrate their commitment to healthy and safety uh, indoor spaces by showing dashboards that actually invested in a, a very cost effective or affordable dashboard that shows what the air, indoor air quality is in different parts of their hotel. And they've been now able to then take those numbers. Um, you know, there's variables, there's usually about 10 variables that we would measure in the air. And they've been able to interpret is, it, is you know, what is the quality of the air and why everyone should go, oh, thank you for caring about me. Um, and I've seen so I've seen uh, I've, I've seen a real evolution of some really innovative ways to tell the story. I've seen QR codes in hotels. I've seen uh, I was in a hotel the other day. I went into my room. I turned on the TV. Said, "Welcome, Gavin." And here was the thirty second video showing me how my room would be clean in thirty. It was cleaned in thirty seconds before I got there. I went, "Wow, that's fantastic!" So it's I know that hotels have invested in programs, products, technologies. Uh, they've invested in their staff their, and, 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 and so many other things. But being able to say that precisely, um, validate um, and say it in a way that, that, that gives you the confidence that you are safe. I'm seeing some great examples out there. And I wish I could share them all with you because it, 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 this has really caught me by surprise. And I think it's fantastic. Thank you, Gavin. So as we... Um, bring bring this panel um, discussion to a close. Um, is there anything that you would like to share with the um, with our audience with regard to you know health, wellness, resilience moving forward in the in this age of pandemics? Um, it's a very odd thing for me to say in the age of pandemics, but it is a reality that we're dealing with today. And as we move forward, how can we work together as leadership uh, to be resilient? Um, Michael, why don't we start with you? I think it's kind of basic. It's having a level of respect that different people have different tolerances for whether it be cleanliness uh, or you know, what's been going on in the world. Obviously, we, we all read about the different political point of view, but generally speaking, there are more people, some people are gonna have a lot more concern than others. And I think you just have to have respect for everyone's different position and realize we're all trying to get to a better place uh, and just allow them 
to feel the way they feel. Thank you. Anton? I love that um, respect. You know, I've noticed that with my own team members. Uh, there's team members here that uh, continue to wear masks and are a little bit more cautious than others. Um, I think that's an excellent point. And as leaders within our industry, um, we, we need to lead by that and respecting, and again, our, our, our colleagues, our team members, and then guests, you know, guests when you approach, uh, when I approach a guest in the lobby, you know, things are different now. You're not leaning in, you're not, you, you know, you may not want to embrace as you did one time. Um, and I think that's important. I think things like this, I think this is a wonderful opportunity. And I thank you again for, for having me. And it's communicating with one another and, and keeping our ears to the ground as, as leaders in the industry and encouraging our managers to do the same. Um, I'm in constant contact uh, with, with fellow hotel colleagues, you know, who I might compete for business with, um, but I find it's important that we're communicating um, about what lies ahead and, and listening um, to the scientists and, and following uh, the CDC and, and those experts um, and being them more aware. I mean, I know it breaks everybody's heart. Um, certainly, I didn't think I was going to be living through a pandemic in my lifetime. And the thought of, the, of going through another one, um, hopefully it won't be for another five or 10 years, but just being more aware and more communicative uh, with one another, um, I think is going to help us greatly as we navigate through this, uh, this difficult time. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Frank? I think one of the biggest lessons of the, the last two and a half years is that we've we've really learned to to do less with more or more with less, excuse me. You know, we, we went through the period of, you know, shutting down facilities and having to reopen them and then dealing with trying to get the staff back on board. We're still dealing with that, uh, not just in the, in the hotel industry, but, but across the whole, the whole travel uh, industry. Um, so, you know, we, we had to get very, you know, resourceful and innovative. And I think that, you know, some of those things are going to be permanent changes, right? Well, we've been doing more clustering and realizing that it works where you have a, you know, director of sales that oversees two or three properties versus one. Um, you know, the business levels will eventually get back to a point where it will afford us to have, you know, what I'd like to call full staffing. Uh, but I think some of these changes, uh, you know, we, we, we never really took that leap of faith before that we could, you know, operate a big banquet with five people and turn 96 rooms, right? <laughs> you know, it says, Michael said it early on, it's all about the team, right? Everybody's got to pull together and, and, and make it happen. And I think that uh, that's probably been the, the most, you know, again, positive thing uh, from my perspective of the, the last couple of years. Thank you. And Gavin? I think it's really important. Anton mentioned it, the fact that he's talking to scientists. Gosh, Anton, when, when did you start doing that? Um, and the fact that as a scientist, I can sit at your table and not fully understand everything you do, but help you with all aspects of your business. And you don't have to, I don't have to prescribe what you do, but I can work in partnership and say, what's the problem? What's the solution? Is it sustainable? Is it validated? Is it cost effective? No, Gavin, it's not come up with another one. And I think that's what we work with our, our GBAC team is trying to ensure that what we do is real. More importantly, it's doable and you get a return on investment. Thank you. I have to tell you from a personal standpoint, I mean, Gavin and I have, before we joined GBAC and, and ISSA, the World Leading Trade Association for the Cleaning Industry, um, we really were at the front lines with healthcare um, during the Ebola outbreak. Um, I was in research and pharma for many years and actually um, was in uh, infectious disease research um, as a scientist and then also as a biosafety professional. I've worked all around the world from that high level containment response kind of thought. And one of my passions, and I know it's also Gavin's passion, is to look at real life world that the application of what we do is really at the at the front line of day-to-day -day work. We're not ready. We're not prepared. We're not resilient if we do not address the frontline worker. And I mean, from the emergency response personnel, the police departments, the fire departments, the EMS, to front desk uh, lobby um, hoteliers, um, to the restaurant owners, it is there that if we don't become prepared, that when the next pandemic hits, or even to get through this that we're with at the very end, that is where we have such as individuals and as hoteliers and as the travel industry, 
have such an amazing, not only ability to make a difference, but also a responsibility. And I always equate it because everybody asks me, well, you know, did you have, have you enjoyed this last couple of years? And I'm sitting there going, that's a really tough way to answer this. You know, as an, if you were an emergency room medicine physician, you've trained many years to be an MD, to be able to be there when someone comes in the door that's hurt. And you hope you never see a patient come through that door. But when they do, you're really glad to be there. We're really glad that we've been able to be there to help with the hospitality industry and all the industries that we provide support to. Um, and we learn from you every single day, the challenges that you guys are facing, whether it's, you know, staffing, whether it's technologies that help you do what you do at a very high level. And we really want to thank you, every, our, our panelists here today, as well as the International Luxury Hotel Association for this opportunity to spend time with you. And we really do look forward to spending time with each and every one of you moving forward. So thank you very much.